I'm going to talk you through Hamlet Act 3, Scene 3. It starts with Claudius talking to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Claudius says, I like him not, nor stands it safe with us to let his madness range. He's talking about Hamlet here, and when he says us, he's using the royal we, so he means it's not safe for me to let Hamlet's craziness continue to uh, live and go crazy throughout my castle. Therefore, therefore, prepare you. I, your commission, will forthwith dispatch, and he to England shall along with you. I'm going to send Hamlet with you guys to England. The terms of our estate may not endure hazard so dangerous as doth hourly grow out of his brows. The terms of our estate, uh, what Claudius means there, is my position as king may not endure the danger that is growing in Hamlet. Guildenstern then promises to keep those many, many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty. Guildenstern says, you're right. We have to keep everybody safe. This isn't just about you, but about the whole kingdom. Rosencrantz then, reminiscent of Polonius, uses a lot of words to show how committed he is to the king, how loyal he is to the king. The single and peculiar life is bound to keep itself from noyance, but much more that spirit upon whose wheel depend and rest the lives of many. So he says, yeah, every single life tries to keep itself from annoyance or danger, but it's even more important that the spirit, not the person, but the spirit upon whose wheel depend and rest the lives of many, the spirit, the king, who many people depend on, it's so important to keep that king safe. The cease of majesty, the death of a king, dies not alone, but like a gulf doth draw what's near it with it. Rosencrantz here is stay, saying like a sinkhole or like quicksand, if a king goes down, he's going to pull everything with him, the whole kingdom. Rosencrantz continues with some figurative language here. It is a massy wheel fixed on the summit of the highest mount. It's like a wheel attached to a big, big mountain, to whose huge spokes ten thousand lesser things are mortised and adjoined. Out from this really important wheel that is the king, there are spokes. Ten thousand things are attached to the king through these spokes, which, when it falls, when the king falls, when the wheel falls, each small annexment, petty consequence, attends the boisterous ruin. If the king falls, ten thousand lesser things will fall and be damaged with him. So the whole kingdom is going to go to disaster if the king falls. Never alone did the king sigh, but with a general groan. So when the king is suffering, when the king is under duress, then the entire kingdom is groaning and suffering with him. Polonius says, um, Polonius enters after Rosencrantz and Guildenstern leave, and the king thanks them. And Polonius says, My lord, he's Hamlet's going to his mother's closet. Behind the heiress, I'll convey myself to hear the process. So again, Polonius is following the plan that he always has. I'll hide behind something and eavesdrop and listen in. A lie, in a sense, pretending that I'm not there, even though I am there, to find the truth. I'll warrant she'll tax him home. I bet she'll really get to the bottom of this. And as you said, and wisely was it said, tis meet that some more audience than a mother, since nature makes them partial, should o'erhear the speech of vantage. So Polonius here is giving credit to Claudius, um, which seems undue. I don't remember Claudius ever saying that, uh, that this was a good plan or that Polonius should be there, but Polonius is giving credit to Claudius because he's always playing that three-dimensional chess to try to show that he is giving honor to the king, thinking that he will get power by, uh, by apparently not seeking to get power, but doing everything for the king. And uh, what's going to happen? So he's going to be in the room to listen. And why? Because Gertrude, a mother, cannot be impartial. Gertrude's nature as a mother makes her subjective. 
she's not going to be able to see the truth in Hamlet because she's a mother. So Polonius needs to be there to be objective and find the truth. So again, we're getting this complex nature of truth. Who you are, according to Polonius, determines whether you can see the truth in a situation. If you are too intimately involved, you can't see the truth. Fare you well, my liege. I'll call upon you ere you go to bed and tell you what I know. So Polonius seems to think that Claudius, uh, even though he says he's in danger, can just kind of go off to bed and not really worry about things, and Polonius will come and save the day and tell him the news. Then Claudius uh, is by himself. He actually kneels, so you can take this as um, a posture of prayer. And he says, Oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it, a brother's murder. So he's making an allusion here to Cain and Abel and a brother killing a brother. And he, for the first uh, time, makes it absolutely clear to the audience, he did it. He committed the murder. Uh, before he has kind of hinted at it, but now he says it uh, as plain as day. Pray can I not. Even though he's in the posture of prayer and kneeling, he says he can't pray. Though inclination be as sharp as will, my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. So even though I have a strong desire or inclination to pray, my stronger guilt defeats it. My guilt won't allow me to pray. And like a man to double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall first begin and both neglect. So he doesn't know what to do, to do something about his guilt or to pray, and because he doesn't know what to do first, he doesn't do either of them. He doesn't pray, and he doesn't do anything to make up for his guilt that he feels. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? He's talking about a hypothetical here, saying what if I had even more sin, I had even more blood than I have on my hands, uh, what, what would I be able to do? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Isn't there enough mercy in heaven, even if I did worse sin than I have done, to grant me forgiveness? Doesn't heaven have enough mercy to give for any sin? Where to serves mercy but to confront the visage of offense? That's the whole point of mercy to confront the face of sin. And what's in prayer but this twofold force? So there are two reasons to pray. Why pray? To be forestalled ere we come to fall, to prevent us from sinning, or pardoned being down, or to pardon us once we have sinned. Then I'll look up. So now I'm going to look up to heaven, uh, or then would mean after I would pray, I would be able to look up to heaven. My fault is past, my sin is behind me. But oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder? That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. So he's trying to figure out what would he pray. If he prayed, forgive me my foul murder, then uh, he'd have a problem because he still possesses the consequences of his sin. What are those consequences? My crown, my own ambition, and my queen. Can I truly be forgiven if I keep what I got from sinning? May one be pardoned and retain the, off the offense. Then he goes on to say, In the corrupted currents of this world, offenses gilded in hand, gilded hand may shove by justice. So gilded means covered in gold. And he says, in the world, the gold that you get from sinning may shove by justice, may be used to avoid justice. And oft tis seen the wicked prize itself buys out the law. Often the thing that you get from sinning, the money or whatever, is able to be used to get yourself out of your um, your judgment 
in this world. But tis not so above, but that's not how it works in the afterlife. There is no shuffling. There's no trading. There the action lies in his true nature. In heaven the truth is known. And we ourselves compelled, even to the teeth and forehead of our fault, to give in evidence. And in heaven we're compelled. We can't do anything about it. We have to give up the evidence of who or what we truly are. What then? What rests? Try what repentance can. What can it not? So what can repentance actually do and what can't it do? Yet when, yet what can it when one cannot repent? What can repentance do if I can't bring myself to actually repent? O oh, wretched state, O oh, bosom black as death, O oh, limed soul that's struggling to be free, art more engaged. So as I try to free my soul, to get some liberty and some forgiveness, I seem to just be getting myself more stuck in the difficult situation that I'm in. Help, angels, make essay. Bow stubborn knees and heart with strings of steel. Be soft as sinews of the newborn babe. So he's asking for the angels to help him to make a, an attempt. And then he's commanding his body to pray. He's commanding his knees to bow and his heart and muscles to be like a baby. All may be well. I can get forgiveness. At this time, Hamlet enters the scene, and he sees Claudius, vulnerable, kneeling. Hamlet says, now might I do it, Pat. Now I can kill him. Now he is a-praying, and now I'll do it. I'm going to kill him right now. And so he goes to heaven. And so am I revenged? That would be scammed. A villain kills my father, and for that I, his sole son, do this same villain send to heaven? So basically Hamlet's saying, if I kill him while he's praying, instead of going to hell or purgatory, he's actually going to go to heaven because he could be asking for, her, for forgiveness of his sins. Oh, this is higher in salary, not revenge. I would be doing Claudius a favor to send him to heaven instead of actually uh, avenging my father. He took my father grossly full of bread, with all his crimes broad-blown as flush as may. And how, stands his, how his audit stands? Who knows save heaven? So if I kill him, he could possibly go to heaven, could go to purgatory, could go to hell. Nobody knows except for heaven. But would this actually be avenging my father? But in circumstance, in course of thought, tis heavy with him. Um... Things seem to be weighing on the king. And am I then revenged to take him in the purging of his soul? If things are heavy with him right now, he could be cleansing his soul. When he is fit and seasoned for his passage, he might go to heaven. No, up, sword, and know thou a more horrid hent. No, I have to put away my sword and wait for a more sinful time. When he is drunk asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at game of swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it. I need to find him when he's sinning. Then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell, where to it goes. No, I have to find him when his soul's black, and I'll kill him then. My mother stays, this physic but prolongs thy sickly days. I'm not supposed to kill my mom, uh, but... These days are bad. And then Claudius says, My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. And basically he's saying, Because I won't give up what I've gotten from sinning, I know that my words don't match the truth of my thoughts, and so my words in prayer would not actually go to heaven. So again, we see this conflict of appearances being deceiving. I can go through the motions of prayer, but if I don't actually mean it, it's not the truth. We see actors who have true emotions based on a fake play, and all of this complicates our understanding of truth.
and appearances. I hope this helps.